Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, you are here. Hopefully you understand that you're here for the panel on suffering. Um, it'll be really informal. Sunday nights is family night. So tonight we've got David Good, Stephanie Strickland, and Lori Woosley. And they are three covenant members here at IDC who have experienced some level of suffering. And they all have sort of different angles. And they're just going to share with you the details of what they've been through and then what they've learned about the Lord in it and, and just kind of how they've witnessed his grace throughout their suffering. So uh, we're just going to go ahead and dive right in. At the end, we will have question time. So if you have a question you'd like to ask them, there will be time at the end. So this first question is for everyone. Um, briefly describe the circumstances of your suffering. Lori, do you just want to start and we'll go this way? Sure. Hi, I'm Lori. Just to say it again. Um, my circumstances don't involve a tragedy, per se, in life, yet more of a, a daily enduring. In February 2018, I went to bed as usual and was awake, unable to sleep most of the night. Um, I wasn't stressed or, like, staying up thinking about things, as most people have said, like, oh, what was on your mind? Nothing, just couldn't sleep. Um, and it was the beginning of many months of many, many nights of very little sleep. And when I say very little sleep, I feel like I have to clarify, because I think a lot of people that haven't experienced insomnia think, like, oh, you're a little tired. But I'm telling, like, sleeping, like, one to three hours a night at times. Um, we went to the doctor, which led to many multiple doctor's appointments, trying to figure out why the sudden onset of insomnia um, many other physical symptoms began as a result of this, and we had and still have no real answers. Um, it was as if a switch had been turned off and my body just wouldn't work the way it had anymore. Um, it's been a time of up and down. Um, it's better than it was. It's not great. Um, just a slow deterioration with, with no real answers or end in sight, and it's, it's definitely affected every area of life. Um, my name is Stephanie, and uh, the suffering in my life that has impacted me the most was the loss of our first child, Hope Ayanna Strickland. Um, about halfway through our pregnancy, we went to go find out if we we're having a boy or girl, and if I cry, I am sorry, it's going to happen. Um, yeah, we went to go find out if we were having a boy or girl, and in um, the waiting room or the ultrasound room, we came and found that something was wrong and that there was a very high chance that she would not make it. So about, um, basically she had a chromosome disorder and it led to a thing called high drops. So she was retaining a lot of fluid. And basically for six weeks, we would check her heart rate every single day to see if it was still beating. And um, I'll never forget the morning, my husband said, I'm getting scared of checking because I'm getting so used to hearing it, and I'm afraid of the day when we're not gonna hear a heartbeat anymore. And so it was that day that we didn't hear a heartbeat, and so we went to the hospital, and um, they induced me, and I delivered our baby girl, and um, it was a joyous thing, and the fact that we got to meet her and hold her, and I'm very thankful for that, but it was also a time that we had to say goodbye at the same time. So we've had, um, Definitely a lot of despair in the, in the beginning of that and struggling through dealing with the loss of our child. I get to be on stage with three beautiful ladies, so my suffering has come to an end. <laughs> my name is David Good, and early this year, January, February, I was diagnosed with stage 3C prostate cancer it turned out to be very aggressive. Gleason scores were in the nines, and they range from three to nine. The PSA was over 40, and that normally should be about three or four. And I was given a number of options, but first my daughter Lisa came and she said, Dad, we're gonna, we're gonna beat this thing, and I'm gonna take, we're gonna go to the most, uh, the best cancer center in the U.S., we're gonna go to, MD Anderson in Houston, so we jumped on a plane the next day, went to MD Anderson in Houston, and the following week we went to Turk Oncology in Jacksonville, who specializes in prostate cancer, and then went to Duke University Hospital. And we prayed a whole lot about it because we were trying to determine the best course of action. I think it's one thing to pray, but sometimes you have to then get up and act, and you have to do something. You can't just lay in bed and, and pray about it. And, we did that, and the Lord gave us clear-cut 
answers to our prayer that Duke University Hospital and the treatment plan they proposed was the right one. And we had real peace about it. It was confirmed with MD Anderson in Houston. And the plan was really to do a number of months of hormone treatment. We did seven of them, which is just being completed right now. We also did four weeks of everyday radiation treatment in the hospital. That's about 30 days behind us right now. And in addition, we took an experimental, I call it experimental drug called abiraterone. It's only experimental from the standpoint that there's no good tests on it. But they recommended it to treat this aggressive cancer. And as a matter of fact, it was very difficult to even see if the insurance company would cover it. And we had to have MD Anderson and Duke write letters and, and they did approve it. And you know, the, the deductibles were really, really high, but had you had to pay cash for it, they were like $5,700. Uh, for one month's supply of, of these uh, chemotherapy drugs. But thank the Lord, the drug companies or the insurance companies agreed to cover. We had to pay the, you know, the deductible, which, uh, which of course was substantial, but it didn't matter because we felt we were on the right track. So we're dealing with prostate cancer. We're dealing with those three treatments that are coming up and then looking down the road to see, actually to see what the Lord was gonna do. First of all, thank you all for sharing. Um, I know it's no light thing to share your struggles with us, but um, we are family here, and so we're very grateful that you've taken the time to do this tonight. Um, when your season of suffering initially started, like what thoughts dominated your mind? You know, our theology is often put to the test when our circumstances aren't ideas. So what were some of those early thoughts for you? You know, that's something you wonder about when you, you hear about people that are getting the diagnosis. Um, you have cancer and it's very aggressive. How are you gonna to respond to that? Surgery was not an option because it was too aggressive for surgery to be a possibility. And I told you about the various treatments they were proposing, but here's, this is actually how I reacted. At first I was, I was surprised, but within, literally within seconds, I thought to myself, or rather the Lord gave me the thoughts that, you know who's not surprised? The Lord says, I'm not surprised. And I realized that if my trust is in him, if he is in charge, how can I be surprised? So I just have to trust him through the process. And literally, that's what I was able to do, is just say, he's not surprised, therefore I can't be surprised. So for me, um, really a lot of despair in the beginning with a lot of my thoughts and really struggling to trust God. Some of the biggest questions I feel like I asked were why. I feel like that's always a big question of, well, why? God, you're sovereign and you're in control of everything. So why did you allow this to happen? And um, why didn't you heal her? You can do anything, you know? So those were definitely some big questions. And then another one specifically for me, with being a first-time mom, I really struggled with what do I do now? Um, here I was, we had made plans for me to stop working and to um, be a stay-at-home mom. We were moving, all this different stuff, and then we lost her. And so it was kind of a, a, wake, a shake of what do I do now? I remember um, saying the statement, well, I'm a mom, but I don't have a, a baby in my arms. I don't have a child to take care of. So really the rock of my role kind of was a big question that I started asking. Uh, same for me, the, the questions of why, I remember telling my husband, Jeremy, you know, if we knew something was wrong with one of our children, as loving parents, we, if we had the capability to be able to fix it, we would. So why was God not fixing this, changing it, healing me? Um, you know, even his word, he says he, he grants sleep to his beloved, so kind of wrestling through, what does that mean then? Um, so yeah, a lot of whys. Uh, as your suffering continued on, like what did you learn about the Lord? And then what did you learn about yourself as a result of your suffering? Um, definitely learned that, that God is constant. Uh, my feelings, my thoughts, my irrational thoughts, 
Uh, when you're sleep deprived, your thoughts are, are not real clear at all. Your emotions are not steady for sure. Uh, so knowing that I'm not constant, but that he is. Um, and that my experiences, my feelings, my circumstances can't tell me who God is. Only God's word tells me who he is. And so just teaching that to myself, preaching that to myself through a lot of different ways. So um, I think one for me is that he's present. Um, I think, you know, if you read the story of Job and you see everything that's going on, it's easy for us to think that God is distant and he's not in control. Because I think that was something I was wrestling with. That, well, you, you, were, you say you're in control, but why is all this stuff happening? And to really see that he is close, he is present, he's close to the brokenhearted, it says in Psalms. And so it's just like, that was a big thing of seeing um, that he is there. I think another one for me in answering the question of wh what do I do now uh, was really starting to see my calling hasn't changed in the fact that I'm called to worship God. I'm called to glorify him. And um, that doesn't change whether I'm a mom with a baby in my arms or if I don't have a baby in my arms or if my circumstances are not what I want them to be. So um, I, I was thrown, blown away if you look at Job and you see his response right after everything happens and it's like he grieved and then he worshiped and I was like, what? <laughs> Um, how do you worship in a, in a midst of all this pain going on? But I think it was um, the right understanding of everything is his. And we, we are his children. How can we not worship our king? How can we not praise his name? So that's something that has been a, a journey of having to uh, learn and also to re-trust him again and again and again and, and saying, I surrender to your will. The last thing Stephanie said was to re-trust him again. And I think trusting him is, is something I learned to re-trust him. You know, the advantage of being as old as I am is that you've got a lot of history and a lot of years behind you. And over those years, I've learned to trust God. And the thing is, when you trust him the first time, he shows up. It's easier to trust him the next time. And if you trust them year after year for thing after thing after thing, it becomes easier when you get a situation like this to say, I trust you. And because of that, I was able to say, I trust you. And I really did. Now, that's not to say, sometimes that trust, sometimes your faith wavers. I remember it was like two weeks before radiation was to begin. I got online and I'm looking at all the side effects and all the negative parts of radiation and all these things and I'm taking the hormone therapy and I'm taking the chemotherapy and they're doing a number on me, believe me. And radiation on top of this? So I looked and I searched and I did all the online research. I called some non-medical um, uh, non doctors in California to look at alternative treatments. I talked with them, thought about flying out, and I, kept, I was going through this entire process. And, and right in the midst of it, it was really, it was very clear. God caught my attention. And he said, well, you trusted me with Duke University and the plan they put forward. He said, don't you trust me now? <laughs> and I immediately I closed my laptop up and said, yes, I do. And so that was... That was one time of really several through the process where maybe my faith or trust wavered a bit, but God always called me back to it once again, and he's faithful. I really appreciate you even saying that because I think that's something that really stands out. God is faithful. I wavered tremendously in the beginning. Um, I did not trust God. I was very angry at him and um, because he didn't do what I wanted him to do. He didn't save her. Um, and I remember, like, I think somebody said in one of the talks, like, well, what if you didn't suffer well? And I'm like, ah, that was me. <laughs> I didn't suffer well. I, I had a really hard time um, wanting to pray and talk to him and wanting to read my Bible. Walter and I would try all kinds of different things, and I just was like, I just can't. I just can't. You have to pray for me, because I can't. And, um, but he was so faithful and patient and um, kind to keep drawing me back like I think about the care of other people and the way that they loved me in the midst of that um, but it just shows so much of like I think the tangible things that we do as a community 
is like ways for us to tell people God loves you. He's right there in the midst of it with you. And you're not alone. Like we're here with you together. I feel like it, that was for months of me not wanting to go to God. Little things like that were ways that he kept telling me, I'm still here. I'm still here. We are leading me into my next question. Um, how did the Lord comfort you? Now, this can be specific things. It can be a very general sense that you got from him. But what comfort did you receive from him? Well, I think one of the ways he comforted me is when he said, don't you trust me? And I think another thing is that when you trust, you don't have fear. You're not supposed to have fear. And you have peace. And he gave me peace about the process. He didn't take me out of all the, the different parts of it that weren't pleasant, etc. but he gave me peace in the process. Um, same kind of thing that, that you were just talking about with, at, at times over the last year and a half, really having a hard time pressing in deeply to the word. So um, a good friend of mine said, rest in the Psalms. And it was just wisdom because it, it the Psalms were very healing, um, something that I could comprehend and, and get into on the really sleepless days. Uh, the primary way, though, that I'd say is the Lord comforted me through through his people, um, my husband, um, parents, specifically some elders, um, just some words of encouragement and, and prayers, very specific prayers. Um, having verses written down all over, my, all over my house, all over my kitchen, just to keep my mind going back, to keep my mind stayed on him. Music, um, some particular books that I read uh, that were just encouraging to read of, of how people have suffered and that it's not always pretty, but that God is faithful even when we're not so pretty. What are some ways that the church was helpful to you? I think I just touched on that a little bit, but just some encouragement. I don't, I can't even tell which all elders are here. I see a few just uh, know that some of the most encouraging moments from this last year and a half have been y'all's specific prayers. Um, probably to y'all, y'all just think, oh, I'm just praying. But to me, it was, it was huge. So thank you. Um, so interesting enough, I would say that I couldn't have asked for the ways that people served us. they I really do feel like if we listen to the Spirit, God will lead people in what to pray and what to do. Um, because some of the ways that people served us, like we moved a week after we buried our daughter. And I had a friend of mine who reached out and said, can I put flowers at your daughter's grave for you while you're gone? And I could have never asked her to do something like that. You know, we had people we lived in an apartment and we painted our walls, so we had to paint them back. So people offered to paint our walls for us so that we could spend time with friends. Like there's so many little things, but then even I would say in the long term of how people cared for us is people would send us a birthday card on her birthday and show that, you know, we remember and we care and we know what you've been through and she mattered. And so there's just different ways. Well, the church was great. The elders called us in, prayed over us. We received, I don't know how many notes of, of encouragement and notes talking about the prayer. We received notes from people asking if they could bring food over, if they could do anything at all, that they were praying. Some of the encouragement that, that I received was just, it was beyond belief, and I've saved them all. If I ever have a down day, and I will, I'm going to go back and read some of those notes because they were, they really, truly blessed me. And, you know, I think one of the, our small group, the leader of our small group, voxed me, I think, virtually every week, asking how I was and could he pray and could they do anything. And then this was, this was a person in a small group we were with seven years earlier sent me a vox and said they're praying and could they do anything? Could they bring a meal? And she's right here, right here. Lori, I hadn't. We'd been in small group seven years earlier, and it just goes to show you she hadn't heard about it, and when she heard about it, she reached out. And our body is such that they do reach out. And uh, I think there's another question that comes along later, what could your church do for you? But that's the same kinds of things they've done 
I'll keep on doing them. One thing I would encourage people like you guys or people like me or people like you out here, if you're suffering, if you're going through something, make people aware of it. Make your small group leader aware of it. Make some of the pastors aware of it because they're there for you. And they can't reach out if they don't know. So I would just encourage anyone that's suffering from whatever sort of thing. If you feel you're suffering, you're suffering. And make people aware of it so they can stand beside you and pray with you and lift you up. Okay, so what has changed in your life, in your beliefs, in your thinking as a result of suffering? Like, how has it changed you? A, a greater daily dependence, for sure. Um, mentally, just having to take each day as it comes, uh, and not think, how do I live the rest of my life like this if it never goes away? Because that can feel overwhelming, for sure. Um, as far as beliefs, I think something that's really changed in my thinking is what I call good isn't necessarily what God calls good, which was a hard thing for me to wrestle through and still is at times. Um, also, much more compassion for those that are going through a difficult season. Um, yeah. Um, I think I'm a different person, very much so. Um, I feel like I knew who God was and I knew different things, but the things about God really rooted itself in the midst of this and really showed me that he is trustworthy, that he is good. I think I'm more compassionate too when you say that. Like when people are going through something, I'm like, I get it. Like I understand what you're going through, even if it's different. Just the fact of this world is fallen and not perfect and we all struggle with different things and I think that's just made me more aware that this is not what we're sp supposed to be living for, but really to desire and want to, to be with him and worship him in heaven. You know, I think just a reinforcement of the fact that he is worthy and that he is trustworthy. And I, I'm almost hesitant not to go here with this next comment because um, I think somehow during this process, which had as much of a toll on my mind, and I had fatigue that was physical, but I also had fatigue that was emotional and mental. And that was almost more difficult than dealing with the, the physical part of things. And at one point, just actually very recently, I, <laughs> here's where I'm hesitant to go. I, back in the beginning, I gave God my, my body. I gave him the, you know, the cancer, the treatments, the, everything that lies ahead. And I was really struggling in my mind as recently as a week or two ago. And I felt like the Lord was saying, did you give me your mind? And I said, yeah, I didn't. Here it is. And literally I took and I surrendered my mind, that thinking part of you, that part the enemy loves to get in when he can and loves to tempt you and, and loves to discourage you and all those kinds of things. And I said, Lord, that's yours now. And I can't tell you what a difference it made. It's, it does sound a little funny in a way, but true. I remember two days later, I was leaving my office and Fonz, my administrating guy, and, and Bonnie, my... Uh, uh, accounts receivable gal and, and I'm walking out the door and I, I, I remember I stopped and I said Fonz, Bonnie I feel so good I felt better than I have felt in eight months and just that fact of feeling good sometimes we take feeling good for granted but maybe going through you know those seven eight months of, of whatever made me then appreciate what, I was probably just feeling normal, but to me I was, wow. So if you're feeling good, if you're enjoying it, and I'm not talking just about physical feelings, I'm talking about your relationship with the Lord and your emotional feeling as well. If you're feeling good, those are good things. Thank the Lord for it and praise him for it. Because until you don't experience it, you don't know how good it can be. How can the church love and serve fellow sufferers well? What can we do? Um, 
The two that I thought of was that I think it's important for us to know good theology. Um, we had an experience when, after our daughter had died, that we received a letter from a friend. And Kent talked about all the different ways of why we suffer. But um, this person only focused on one, and that was that we had lost our daughter because it showed that we were God's children and he was disciplining us. And I think that that's why it's so important. Like, we need to know the truth so that when we're talking to people, we're not saying something that's, I mean, not that that's incorrect. God does discipline us, but that's not why we, we're all going through suffering. And so it's just a way of showing love is to know who God is and his character and his goodness. Because when we're not, when people are suffering and they don't want to have anything to do with God, we have to tell them the truth about who God is. So I think that's one of the most important part. And then the other one is, I think, not to be afraid to talk about it. Um, we're all going through something, you know, it's, our lives are not perfect. And sometimes when we don't say it and we're not talking about, oh, I heard this happen, how are you doing? It almost makes it seem like it didn't exist. So I think it's important for us to ask and talk about the pain, ask about the child, ask about the cancer and what's going on. How is it with not being able to sleep? You know, just really being caring and asking because you care about that person. Yeah, I would say lots of grace and compassion. Um, put yourself in their position. I think that was something I've learned through this is until you've walked a certain road, you don't know what it's like. So try to imagine what they're going through. And um, I would say this is just really practical. Don't minimize or joke about their trial. Obviously, something like this, you would not. But I've had countless people that, you know, I don't hear from like all week, but if they see me somewhere, even at church on Sunday, hey, did you get a good nap? Or, hey, are you sleeping? And it's like, hey. you, you do. and I know their heart behind it. They don't get what it's like to, to be the sleep deprived, but just, I would say that, not as correction, but just encouragement of don't minimize or, or joke about someone's trial. Well, my answer is sort of the same to the other question about what the church had done. Keep on doing the same things they're doing. I think one other thing that comes to mind is that uh, the church and individuals and small group and leadership and would ask me from time to time how things are going. And so actually I put together a little update that I, I send out, not that I'm so important to have an update, but, but realistically people were interested and concerned about what was going on in my life. And so I put together probably every five or six weeks I'd send out an update. And it was encouraging to me to know that People cared, cared enough to ask, how are you going, to, how are you doing today? And so I think that's a, that's a really important thing as well. Um, I know in our own experience with grief last year, uh, we had a point person, Sarah Beth Ventress. I don't even know if you're here or not, but she came in and just took care of everything. And so I didn't have to deal with text and calls and food delivery and um, different things that people were arranging to have done for us. Like everything went through a point person. And I didn't ask her to do that. I was in no frame of mind to even think through what needed to be done. But she just stepped in and said, I'm going to handle everything. And somehow she got the word out to all of our people. And so everyone knew that everything went through her and sort of at the end of the day I would just get a like a one you know a summary of this is what's happening tomorrow this is all you need to worry about and I just never would have thought through that but it's helped me figure out okay when someone else is going through something they need a point person they need someone who can take the reins and who can handle just the daily details of life and I found it incredibly helpful and it was, I, I don't know that I ever appropriately thanked her for it but it was so meaningful to not have to deal with all the details of life in the midst of a season of suffering so I think that's a great idea. Um, okay, last question from me, and then we'll open it up to the audience. But uh, what would you say to other people in our church family who are suffering right now? Um, I just kind of made a list of some very practical things. Um, most of them have come from my wise husband, <laughs> who's had to walk this road with me, uh, to be in the moment but to also keep an eternal mindset, which kind of seems opposite, but um, I think you know what I mean by that. Um, I heard from, from a book that I read one time about just do the next thing. You know, don't get overwhelmed with, oh, there's so much that I need to do or all these tasks in front of me. Just do the very next thing. Be faithful. God doesn't call us to be successful. He just calls us to be faithful um, and to trust in the one who is our sustainer. Um, 
something I've reminded myself of a lot is that he's been faithful till today. So I, I know that he'll be faithful tomorrow. Um, for me, I would say don't run away from God. I think what, what I experienced in seeing that we could run to other things for comfort and they might numb the pain for a little bit, but that pain is still there and that brokenness is still there. But the only way that we can really have comfort is when we run to him. Um, even in people, like pe our community is so great and caring, but they're going to fail us too. They're, they're going to stumble in their best attempt to care for us. And so um, I just want to encourage you to run to him because he's the one that mends the broken heart. And is that a song? That might be a song. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, just that, that he really is where we, we can find healing in the midst of everything. Um, I think I had another one, but I don't remember what it was, so it was important. You know, I think fear is a very significant part of suffering. I think whether it's emotional or whether it's real, physical, not that emotional is not real, but physical versus emotional are two different kinds, but we have fear. And I think it can be the greatest thing uh, that can devastate us. I know when I go into the cancer center, uh, but hey, by the way, if you get to go to the cancer center at Duke, that's like flying business class. I mean, you get the nice, comfortable seats, you get coffee, you get cookies, and <laughs> no, you don't want to be there. But, but when I go in there, every time they give me a form to fill out, and there's a big thermometer on one side, you know, with going up like this, scale from zero to 100, and you're supposed to rank your overall stress level, or fear. I, I consider stress and fear almost the same kind of thing. And then on the right side, there's 10 separate areas where you're supposed to indicate whether you have any stress in these particular areas. They include spiritual, they include physical, they include your treatment plan, they include just a whole host of things, 10 of them, and you know, I just draw a straight line through the, the no side because I know who's in charge of everything. I think there was one time I put yes on one of the, because I was concerned about the outcome of a particular test that was being taken, that was taking place. But they recognize that stress or fear is as much a companion to the physical side of things and can exasperate those physical things much more. And then they offer solutions. If you go to Duke, you can meet with a group, you can meet with a counselor, you can, you know, you get in the cancer um, business class thing and you get a lot, of, a lot of perks. But again, recognizing that fear is a significant thing and stress is a significant thing. Um, I think you really have to recognize that God's in control of all things and all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called. You know, and that doesn't mean all things are always good, but they work out for good. Eventually they do. And not only that, they work together. And I think a key, and I've mentioned this before a couple of times, trust is such an important thing. I heard this recently in a sermon. Um, I think it was, it's, I don't want to take credit for the saying, because it wasn't me, it's from JD, I think, in, in a, a summit sermon that said, if an all-powerful God has purposed our good, why would we fear opposition, struggles, tribulation, illness, relational problems? You know, why would we fear? And he told the story about a father and a son, and they're walking through this very scary part of town. And the boards uh, over the windows are covering them, and there's, there's some fires going in, in some garbage cans, and you know, but the boy, his father reached down and he took his hand. And the little boy had no fear anymore because he was in his father's hands. And I think it's much the same, and maybe that's a little trite, but that is what God is. He's our father, and he's a good, good father. And he reaches down and he takes our hand, and we needn't fear any longer. You know, Psalm 23 is often used when somebody's about to die in the hospital. You go in and you quote Psalm 23 to them and you pray over them. And, but I think Psalm 23 is more than that because as David is saying, he said, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me for thou art with me. And it doesn't mean that there's not evil there. 
It means I will fear no evil. And that evil isn't necessarily death. That evil could be anything. That evil could be a loss of a child. That evil could be what you're going through, Lori. I will, it could be any number of things, but the important part is I will fear no evil. And why? Because you are with me. You know, this morning we sang a song. I think it was the first or second song we sang uh, in the chorus. I like it because it, it just fit perfectly. The chorus goes, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him, how I've proved him, or and or. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. And that's what we need. It may not happen automatically. We need the grace. We need the, we need the prompting. We need to be able to trust him more. And when we trust him, it takes away the fear. And when you take away the fear from whatever is confronting us, it doesn't mean we don't have that problem, but it means we go through it with him and not on our own. Uh, singing is tricky and suffering. I remember telling Donnie um, when we were in the throes of grief that I just wanted to stab him like every Sunday morning because he just kept asking me to sing songs that I didn't want to sing. And it was just difficult. I couldn't do it. And I just kind of sat there and silently cried while everyone sang. And I went to him and confessed my desire to stab him on a weekly basis. And um, he said, Christy, let the body sing over you. And I remember in that moment, like feeling like chains were released. Like, I don't have to sing it if I can't right now, but that's what my church family is here for. They can sing over me. And just these truths that uh, I didn't want to admit was true, even though I knew it, it was like just hard to really admit it when I felt God was had taken something from me that I didn't want him to. Letting the church body sing over me was just healing. And what I couldn't do in the moment, my church family did for me. Um, and so singing, I don't know, it's just been way more special to me since suffering. And uh, I love to sing before that, but I find now I have a, a greater appreciation for singing and suffering. Um, okay, that's all the questions we have up here, but I'd love to hear from y'all. I'm sure they would too. If you have questions, we don't have a mic set up out there, but if you just want to stand and, and shout your question, I can repeat it and then the panelists can answer. So the question just for everybody to hear is, is there a better question maybe than how are you? Like you want to acknowledge uh, the person, but maybe think how are you is lame. So go ahead. Is it lame? It's hard. I was going to, the thing that I was thinking is that sometimes how are you can be like a, hey, how are you? Okay, good. Bye. You know, like, so, but I think when the way you're asking it, it sounds like you're asking like in a caring way, like, hey, how are you? And I don't think that's a bad way of asking it. Maybe there's a better way to ask it, but I think it's all in the intention. If it's just kind of walking by and not really caring, that's one way of asking that. But it sounds like the way you're wanting to ask is more of, how are you doing, man? I really care about you. I think that's right. A lot of people come up and they'll say, well, how are you doing? They don't really want to know. They may want to know, yeah, you're doing okay. But, but the people that are really concerned will then say, how are you really doing? All right, look you in the eye. How are you really doing? Then you know they care. And uh, I think that's, that's an important element. If I understood the question, you're, you're saying, was there another specific time in my life where I had to be able to apply the same principle to the fear issue? Yes, and I'm just kind of when you were speaking about like your age and how you walked with the Lord, I'm just wondering if you're willing to share 
like another time that you learned that first and then that this is reiterating it? Well, <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> The answer is yes, and, and a very definite yes. In 1994 and 95, I made two trips, both with Nancy, into Moscow and into Siberia, and that was a very early time to go in. And I spent uh, two weeks in Siberia with another guy, and we didn't know the language, and we didn't have visas, we didn't know anything, and it was a very dangerous place and a very troublesome kind of situation for many, many reasons. We went back the following year with Nancy and into Siberia, and we were confronted with time after time after time where we didn't know which way to go, how to turn, and we had indeed fear. I remember the night being in this little flat in Olana Day, Siberia, and about midnight there's pounding on the door, and pounding increased, and finally they're trying to break in the door. And I looked at Greg, who was there with me, and I said, well, Greg, what do we do? He said, well, there's the phone. I said, well, uh, who do we call? Uh, well, we call the police. Well, how do we call the police? Well, and if we get them, we don't know the language. What do we say? And if we knew the language and they spoke English, which would be impossible, uh, we don't know where we are. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we honestly had some significant fear. We took a big bureau and put it down and propped it against the door and we backed up to the wall and put our feet on it and that kicking and pushing went on for 30 or 40 minutes and finally they went away. And the next morning went out and there were two sticks that had been sharpened like a weapon. And they had uh, apparently followed us around during the day as we walked and we were careful, but nonetheless, that was, that was a fearful thing. We had lots of other fearful things. And my dear little wife here, she would always resort to, well, honey, why don't we pray about it? <laughs> and time after time after time, we would pray about it. And the prayer, the answer to prayer would be 30 seconds away. I remember we got in, we were going to stow our, our stuff in Irkutsk up in the top of an eighth floor where there was somebody there from, I think, Campus Crusade or whatever. And we got in this little elevator that was no bigger than about three by three with our stuff, Nancy and I. We pushed floor eight and went and stopped. The light went out. Well, yeah, there's a little bit of fear there. There's a lot of fear. Again, we don't know the language. We don't know anybody. There's no help. There's no, and now we're in this dark elevator a third of the way up to the eighth floor. She said, well, why don't we pray about it? <laughs> and we did. And clunk, 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 the elevator, light came on, off it went. <laughs> and I began when we went on that first trip, I did a journal. I put one column, sort of the things that I sensed and felt, the smells, the sounds, the sights. And the other column I put what God did. And when I got all done, I had like 50 pages of things that the Lord did in answers to prayer. And I finally put it in, I made a big journal out of it because it was so unbelievable to see what the Lord did. I remember the night in a very unsavory part of town, we needed, a, we needed a ride to get to the railroad station. And we're there with Greg and Nancy and I and, and all this stuff that we brought over for them is the only way you get things in at that time into the country. And we can't get a car, we can't get a taxi, can't get anything. Now it's finally getting dark. And what does my wife say? Well, why don't we pray about it? And we did. And within, literally within a minute, a car pulls up, not a taxi, but just a private driver. It says, you want to ride? Yeah, we're going to the airport. or going to the train station, excuse me. And uh, off we went. And I, I remember the time we arrived in St. Petersburg, just Nancy and I alone, the two of us in 1995. And we got there and there was supposed to be a guy to pick us up, Pastor Paul from some church outside of St. Petersburg, Russia. And first he didn't show. And when he finally showed, we had all these duffel bags full of things that we had to bring in for Greg and Julianne, who were now in Siberia as, as missionaries. And we said, uh, Pastor Paul, where's your car? He said, oh, we take bus. Well, if you've ever seen buses in Japan or China or Russia or whatever, they're, you know, it's, it's like solid people. And here we are with four or five big, no, no bus. He said, well, we get a car. He couldn't get a car, couldn't get a car, finally. He goes off and walks off to another part of the airport. And Nancy says, why don't we pray about this? 
Next thing you know, he comes back with a Mercedes station wagon. <laughs> and we all hop in and go. Now, some of those are little, some of those are bigger things, but really, they go on and on. And I, I do believe in my life at that point in time, that's where we developed, or that's where I developed a faith and trust in God, because I saw so many things. When we got done with that first trip, I remember getting on Delta Airlines, and we had had so many troublesome, scary things. Nancy got on first. I got on. I plopped my feet down on the transom there on the plane, and I said, America. I said, I'm never going back. I mean, it was literally, by the time I was strapping my seatbelt on next to Nancy, I looked over and I said, honey, we got to go back. When are we going back? And we did the following year, and we did four years later, and you know. But God showed himself so faithful, and, and sometimes little things, sometimes bigger things that we began to rely on him and trust him. So, yeah, I, I have sort of an advantage because I've had that behind me. But I would encourage all of you to, to begin to ask and speak to God and trust him for little things and for big things. And by the time you're my age, you'll look back and say, oh, wow, he is trustworthy indeed. I could tell you some more things. But, <laughs> but anyway, that's it for now. <laughs> okay, another question? That was more than two minutes, wasn't it? Uh, Stephanie, you've got three, you have three kids um, since Hope, and it's been several years, but certainly losing Hope is not less of a tragedy because you have three kids. So I'm just wondering how has grief changed for you over the years? and. Having experienced the birth of three healthy, healthy children, how do you kind of balance looking at them and looking at the years that have gone by and knowing you're not there anymore, but it's, it's still a sad thing? What does that look like for you? Yeah, so definitely still grieving, I would say. Um, even this past summer, we celebrated her seventh birthday, and um, we celebrate it every year. Um, and Walter and I said, we're like, it's harder this time for some reason. Like other years have not seemed hard. It was celebratory, being able to celebrate her life, seeing what God has done through us and in other people's lives through it. But even now, we're at a new season where not many people know us from that time. And so we're telling the story, but you haven't experienced that story with us. So that's even a, you don't, you don't know, you didn't know us. Now the Lowry's knew us then. Um, but yeah, a lot of people don't know that, that season for us. And then even too, um, wondering what it would be like to have a seven-year-old in our house when you see other seven-year-old girls wondering, uh, oh, that's how our girls would probably interact with each other. That's still a challenge. Um, it definitely has gotten not as hard, I would say, not in the despair that I was in the beginning, but there still are definitely moments. And um, I actually think our kids have helped a lot for me because... Our, our daughters talk about them all the, her all the time, how, oh, I wish Hope was here, and can we go see her? And that's such a healing thing for me to go to her grave and see and be there and to pray for the other families that have lost little ones too. And um, for interesting, Walter actually, he didn't grieve much in the very beginning, and that everyone grieves differently. Like, he needed to go do things, and I was like, I'm sitting on the couch and not doing anything. But because he was trying to be so strong for me, he didn't. So years later, he really started to grieve what it was like to have lost her. So there's ups and downs, and sometimes we're fine, and sometimes it hits us harder. So it's still a journey. Uh, scary. Um, fearful that it would happen again. We didn't share with many people that we were pregnant. In fact, every time we've gotten pregnant, we don't really share it with a lot of people because of, am I going to walk this journey again? We're not promised that we're not going to suffer again. We're not promised we're not going to lose another child. And um, so that was definitely very scary. There were moments we had a book club, and at the end of book club, I was pregnant with Ken Kaya. And I was bawling because I was so scared. And I would drink, if I couldn't feel her, I would drink caffeine so I could feel her kick, you know, just the realization that she was still moving in there. And, um, but yeah, it was definitely very scary. Another thing of just 
God, if we have to go through something else, I know you're there. I'm learning the things that you've taught me the first time. Um, hopefully I would suffer a little bit better and because I believe those things a little deeper. Um, but yeah, it was definitely very challenging. And um, it's interesting because we, didn't, we don't share with people, but then other people are the opposite and they'll want to tell somebody right away because if that way if something happens, they've got people around them to share. So we would keep it very small and just tell a few people that we knew if something happened, we could lean on them. Okay, no more questions? Donnie? Lots of things are coming to mind. Um, music <laughs> that kept my mind focused on Christ and not on me and how I felt that day. Um, thinking of ways to obviously keep serving my family, my husband, my children, but also serving people outside of our immediate family. Um, to be honest, there were days though that I couldn't even do that. It was just surviving the day kind of thing but trying to always get back to that of, okay, where, where are needs around me that I can be faithful to, to serve someone else? This may not be right on, on what you're looking for, but, you know, I found myself coming home, putting on the YouTube finding some really neat worship songs, listening to them, listening to some sermons online. Um, I found myself doing those things. I found myself also um, not checking out a life. And we, even during this whole process, we did a trip with both of our kids to the mountains in May. We went with our two sisters to Mendocino, California in August. And I hobbled around there, and it was, but it was okay. We did it. We booked, and we have tickets for a trip to Laos in October. And, you know, so I think I don't view myself as a cancer patient. I don't even view myself as someone that ever had cancer. And I'm, it may be back in three months or six months or what, but you know what? I, that won't be a surprise to my father. And so it just, it's a matter of, of, I don't know, simply trusting him, turning it over him, and going on and not considering who and what you could be thinking of. Poor little me, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. But I'm a child of God, and he's my father. Um, I think I struggle with that, to let, sorry, some, to my eye. Um, I think I struggle with letting what has happened define me sometimes and let that be my new identity instead of my identity be in Christ alone. I think there's a couple things that have helped. So our daughter's name is Hope Ayana, which means hope eternal. And it's just a reminder every time that when people ask about her and I say her name, it's like a reminder to me, it's not about our daughter, it's about where our eternal hope lies and that's with him. And um, so that has really helped to kind of turn me back around. And then I think too, the, the pact about part about worshiping, like how um, it's not, my identity was in the fact I was a mom without a child, but in the fact of like, I'm called to glorify God. So is everything that I'm doing 
pointing to him. So those two things. But it's definitely, I think, a struggle for me because I think a lot, people seem to know, like, oh, if you've gone through some, oh, the Stricklands, they've been through that too. So it's easy to let that be a conversation that leads instead of allowing that conversation lead to point people to Jesus. I might add to what I said. One of the songs I would, I would put on was, was Stanfield's song, um, I jumped out of the grave, <laughs> and because uh, that's how I felt, and that's what was going to happen, and that's, you know, I'm not trying to trick my mind or do anything like that, but I think it is important to think positive, and, and I am going to jump out of the grave someday, so, I, that, you know, you know that, and you go with it, and I remember we've done that song here at church a couple of times, I think, haven't we, Donnie? Yeah. Okay, any more? All right, we'll go ahead and wrap up. We'll end a few minutes early. Um, thank each of you for sharing. I know I have benefited from it, and I'm sure everyone else has as well. Um, I will close us in prayer, and then you have a few minutes before you pick up your kids. Father of mercies and God of all comfort, we bless you. We bless your holy name. We thank you that you do comfort us in our affliction. We thank you that you use our affliction to prepare us for eternal glory that we can't even compare or anything to in our minds, Lord. Um, we thank you that you're good even when you don't feel good to us, Lord, that the truth is true no matter what our emotions say, no matter what our circumstances dictate. Um, you are good, and you love us, and you want good for us. And I pray for each person in this room that as we suffer in different ways, that we will hold on to your truth, that when the devil whispers that you cannot be trusted, that you are not good, that you don't have our best at heart, that we will be reminded of the truth, that we will let um, our brothers and sisters at Imago Day sing it over us, that we will be anchored in the identity of whose we are and who we belong to, and that that will define us, Lord, not our circumstances, not our tragedies. And we look forward to the day when all of our tragedies, Lord, um, comfort others, but also are on the other side of eternity, and that we are with you, and that we will weep no more, we will hurt no more, we will suffer no more. We look forward to that day, and I pray that you will make us bold disciple makers, that we we could tell people about this day that's coming and that how they can have hope when they suffer. We love you, Christ, and we thank you so much for all that you've done for us and how you comfort us in all of our afflictions. In your precious name we pray, amen.